You are listening to the REI Mastermind Podcast. Join JD as he chats with industry-leading real estate experts and professionals. We learn from their experience and uncover the strategies to their success that we can implement into our own businesses and we can drive immediate results today. They share their experience and wisdom as we build the foundation to our own success. This is the REI Mastermind Network. We have Matt Gouget on the call. Matt is mattthemortgageguy.com. Check that out. But uh, Matt has a great series of videos on his YouTube channel. So look for Matt the Mortgage Guy there as well. And he really kind of simplifies things. So it, it's a great resource if you're trying to make sense of, of what you need to get your ducks in a row before you in, get involved in a mortgage broker. But um, Matt has a kind of a unique perspective because he also owns a number of rental properties. Uh, so he's going to give us uh, some A to Z. What do we need to do and what order we need to do it? then hopefully make that process a little smoother. So I really appreciate your time, Matt. And uh, I think we gave everybody your contact information, but again, make sure you check out his YouTube channel, Matt, the mortgage guy. I really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, Jack. So, well, let's, let's start things off. I, I'm always curious uh, a couple things and, and my listeners have probably heard me say this more times than not. Um, I used to be involved in in uh, the banking industry to a certain extent myself, and and it seems like most people who are getting financial service like this, it's usually an accidental pr- uh, profession. Yeah. How did you how did you land into this into this situation? Well, it, it's 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 interesting, I guess, and, and most people's journeys to you know their current profession are interesting because. I, I've always been a math guy and I've always enjoyed math. I've always enjoyed people. Um, went to school for business, got a degree in um, international business, got a you know degree in finance. And after college, I was actually managing a poker room. So I was running a small business, um, not necessarily you know related to what I had studied in school, but I was having a ton of fun doing it. And then in 2014, I had a friend approach me and say, you know, you've got a network, you're, you know, good with people, you enjoy math numbers, you understand business, you should get into mortgage with me. And I remember at the time, it was um, a, a leap of faith doing something that's 100% commission when you've got, you know, your, my second son had just been born. And so I'm the sole, sole provider in the household and whatnot, but um, agreed with my friend in that, you know, I enjoy working with people, good with numbers, and I've got good work ethic and, and might be something I'd, I'd succeed at and really, you know, just jumped in feet first into mortgage and haven't looked back, enjoyed it thoroughly. It's really a, you know, one of those things that, you know, there's, tr- there's, it's, it's very fulfilling work. I'm working mm-hmm. with people on what is the largest transaction of their life more often than not. And whether it's them buying a primary residence and getting to feel that rush of being a homeowner and what it feels like to turn the key and walk in the door when you own the house versus renting it, um, that, or if I'm helping somebody buy their third, fourth, fifth investment property, and I get to talk to them about what it's going to feel like to not have to go to work, whether they choose to or not, they're going to have the option of, I've got enough passive income coming in where, you know, I choose to work and I'm going to continue to do that for five or six more years, but I don't have to. Um, mm-hmm. Both of those scenarios are are super exciting and, and rewarding. And I've got, you know, at least a couple stories that um, if I, if I retell them, I'll, I'll tear up because it's, it's really cool sometimes how you can impact somebody's life um, through, through getting a mortgage and, and owning a piece of real estate. Yeah. So, well, now let's, let's take it the other side of your, the coin of your life here. You got into real estate investing. How did that get about? Well, I think I've always had an interest in real estate. And then when I got into mortgage, I obviously was having a lot of conversations about real estate. And so I think that that, um, kind of pushed me over the edge where as I, um, you know, bought my first house in 2006, well before I got into the mortgage industry um, and knew enough people in mortgage, in real estate investing. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. That's cool. I remember actually looking um, at some stuff in my neighborhood in 2011, 2012, thinking, 
man, for 180 grand, it's a, it's a smoking deal. And in California, um, you know, for anybody who's listening outside of California, 180,000 is pretty, pretty much free. Um, but it wasn't until I got into mortgage, started living vicariously through some folks and saying like, man, this guy's 35, just like I am. Um, he owns 24 single family properties that kick off 7,500 a month in passive income. Like, that's pretty cool. Why, why am I not doing that? And uh, I tell this story to a lot of people who are just getting started. As much as I was involved, as much as I knew, and as much as I was gung-ho about real estate, I procrastinated like anybody else. And I put mm-hmm. it off and talked about it and listened to every single Bigger Pockets podcast. And it took what was three or four years until I finally pulled the trigger, bought that first investment property. That wasn't just my primary that I bought in 2006. And then, you know, the next year did what a lot of people do in their real estate investing journey was just moved out of my primary and bought a new primary. And that old one became an investment property. And then sure. from there it was, you know, a couple of multifamilies and then another single family. And it was, it was off to the races. And now it's, it's something that I'm actively doing. I'm actively um, you know, alongside the clients that I'm working with that are looking at investment properties, I can have the conversations with them about what they're doing, the criteria that they're looking for and all that um, on a higher level, I think, because I'm doing the same thing. And and when I talk to them about cash on cash returns and, you know, whether they're looking in a B plus neighborhood or a C minus neighborhood, um, I'm, I'm actively doing that myself, which I think for investors, it's important for you to connect with a real estate agent who's also an active investor if you're looking for investment properties and also a mortgage broker because you know the the things you're going to look for and the advice you're going to get is going to vary um, based on your goals and if and if you connect with somebody who's got similar goals or at least is walking that same path I think you get higher level advising that way mm-hmm. so you know you've done this quite a for quite a while now and you've probably advised a number of uh, first-time real estate investors, what do you? When do they get somebody like you involved? Like, uh, because you're a mortgage broker, and we probably should define what a broker is, because you're not technically going directly to a bank. You're going to a broker that can kind of help you find the best options, right? Right, exactly. And I'm a big proponent of the broker channel. I've been a broker since 2018. I spent the first four and a half years um, working in retail, which just means that I was working for one company and every loan I did went to that same company. And, you know, if you can think of it like a state farm insurance agent, all of their policies get written to state farm. When then if you talk to a broker, they can look at 15 different companies, 30 different companies, whatever it is. As a mortgage broker, I'm able to take the client specific scenario, 675 credit score, three and a half percent down, you know, no, um, you know, foreclosures or, or what, what have you. And, and this price point, whatever it is, all those different factors that go into uh, what type of mortgage is best for them. I'm also going to look at different lenders and say, this lender is offering great pricing on that scenario. This lender, not so much. This lender can close it in 22 days. And I know we need to close to actually get an offer accepted in this market. All those different scenarios, I get to shop between different lenders and say, for you, based on your scenario, based on what you're trying to do, here's the best lender for your situation and submit the loan to that specific wholesale lender. So um, that's that's been been fun and exciting. That's what I do as a mortgage broker. Back to your question about the, the first-time investor, you want to get an idea of what your goals are. And then I think as soon as possible, I advise people, if nothing else, a conversation mm-hmm. with a mortgage professional. And it could be a mortgage broker, it could be a it could be a, you know, retail banker. I'm I'm biased and I think that the mortgage broker is the best place for someone to get a home loan, but whatever you do, you want to have the conversation around how you're going to finance the real estate you're trying to buy because I can tell you with the, from experience, I'll talk to people all the time that aren't sure how much money they need to put down. They're not sure if they even qualify. They're not sure if um they should be putting themselves and their partner both on the loan. They're not sure, you know, all these different things that before you get out there and start thinking about putting in offers or what type of cash on cash returns you're going to receive, let's first see how much you qualify for, what type of program 
that is that best suits you, um, how much you're going to have to put down. Cause then, you know, the, the money, the capital requirements might affect, you know, you might have thought you were going to put 10% down and then you hear like, Oh, if I'm buying a three to four unit, I've got to put 25% down. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. Um, all, all those things are a good reason and getting pre-approved for a mortgage is absolutely free. It doesn't cost you anything. And every single day, probably either myself or somebody on my team talks to somebody, I don't want you to pull my credit yet. I don't want to get pre-approved. I don't want to do all that. Well, you kind of have to, to really have an understanding of exactly what you qualify for and what the loan's going to look like. So I spend the money pulling your credit report. I spend the time, effort, and energy, me and my support staff working through um, your file and figuring out your income and all that other stuff. Um, and we're more than happy to do it. It doesn't cost you a dime, but with that information, you're going to be better equipped and you're going to have a better understanding of, okay, here's my path. Here's the type of loan I want to use. Here's how much cash it's going to take. And then, you know, let that help you develop a game plan because um, it surprises the heck out of me, Jack, but you, you, you'd be, you'd be surprised whether it's a primary or an investment property, people are like, I want to buy something for this price that does, you know, this much in revenue. I want to buy something for this price because it's close to, to the school my kid's going to, and I'm going to put roughly this much down. No idea what the payment is. No idea what the numbers look like. And, and these people, you know, not all of them, but they're walking through open houses. They're submitting offers, not having any idea what the numbers look like when all it takes is an hour of their time, application docs, get it into a professional who can review it and then tell you, okay, if you buy it 375, here's what it's going to look like. You buy it 400, here's what it's going to look like. And I, with every single pre-approval, we provide an Excel spreadsheet that somebody can actually um, edit and see how the different purchase prices affect, you know, what their monthly payment's going to be, how much cash they're going to bring to close. It's important when you're buying a house to live in. I think it's even more important if you're buying an investment property because- mm-hmm a lot of these conversations uncover, oh, wow, well, I wasn't thinking about that or that, or I didn't realize that my payment was going to be that much. And all of a sudden, you know, the thing thing barely breaks even as a Airbnb. God forbid you got to do a a long-term rental and that thing, the thing is going to bleed $800 a month. So um, it's not not the deal you thought it was because you hadn't looked at the numbers yet. Right. Well, just a reminder, for more information, make sure you hit check out his Matt's YouTube channel, Matt the Mortgage Guy, uh, and uh, Matt the Mortgage Guy dot com. Uh, you you make it pretty easy and keep that brand consistent. Right? Yeah, I try to, and that that's the <laughs> thing too. Is when I was first getting started, you know, all the all the fancy branding and all that. My wife's just like, people just want a mortgage guy. You're just gonna be the mortgage guy, and so uh, yeah, it's it's worked for me. And to your point about the channel, if if you go to Matt the Mortgage Guy on YouTube and you type in you know, FHA loans, you type in gift of equity purchase, whatever your question is, I'm slowly but surely trying to have an answer to everything. And and close to 500 videos, there should be um, something related to what you're looking for. If it's a commonly asked question, if not, you can always, you know, ping my YouTube comments. I try to read and respond to all of them. It's getting harder with 100,000 views a month, but um even even if if you don't find your answer there, what I've started to do over these last 12 weeks is every Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, I'm going live and doing a Q&A. And it's been super fun for me because I relearn old things that I forgot because I haven't, mm-hmm. I haven't seen them in two or three years. And um, the, the engaging conversation about, oh, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting scenario. I know when I answer a question for somebody that 10 other people have the question. So I think it's, it's, it's a really good interactive way to get questions answered and, and provide people with some, you know, real time answers. Because like I, like I tell people, one of the benefits of that is if you Google something, you might get an answer that was posted in 2018. Lending guidelines change often enough that if you Google something and it says, oh yeah, we're going to use one half of 1% of your balance as uh, your repayment on your student loans. That rule might've changed three times in the last five years on, you know, how Fannie and Freddie and the different agencies that take these loans are looking at 
how they calculate student loan debt and whatnot. So um, asking a question in real time in July, 2021, uh, somebody answering them in real time in July, 2021 is a lot better than searching Google and hoping that the answer is, is still relevant when you find it. Sure. Well, you know, I, one of the questions that I had here for you tonight is that a lot of people don't take a certain action just because of the fear of the unknown. Can you give us in summary, like the process to get pre-approved? Yeah, for sure. And I think that that's one thing that with, with every other process that we have in my business, we've tried to refine it, make it better, make it smoother, make it easier. Um, for somebody who's looking to get pre-approved, we've got an online application and there's, there's many different companies that do it. Flowify is a company that we've used for the last couple of years that make it super easy where, you know, you answer the questions and you could probably click through this application in 15, 20 minutes tops. Once the application's complete, thanks for entrusting us with your loan. It, it, it auto responds to you. Here's the link to securely upload the docs and it will tell you you know, I remember when I was first starting out, I had to e- email somebody a list, you know, and then maybe they printed out the list and they looked at it. The, the software is telling you, here's what we need. And here's the different buckets you upload it to. So once you upload 2019, 2020 W2s, that's checked off. Then you upload your copy of your identification, that's checked off. And you upload 30 days of pay stub, checked off. And, you know, so five or six different documents you need to upload depending on if self-employed or W-2 income, depending on, you know, if you have other rental properties or this is your only um, piece of real estate. Once we have all that stuff, within 24 hours, we're reviewing it. We're pulling your credit. Something that you answered on the application was, do we have authorization to pull your credit, which we have to do on a pre-approval. And, you know, within 24 hours, thanks for applying with us. Um, As you stated in your application under your goals, you're looking to buy something around 300,000 with 5% down. You're you're approved well beyond that, could probably buy up to 400, but we put together um, some scenarios for you at 275, 300, and 325. And that's where I'm trying to provide answers to questions you might not even asked yet, you know, because somebody's looking for a loan at 300,000 purchase price with 5% down. I want to provide you with what that's going to look like. Cause I think it's important. I think it's important to look at, okay, if I bought some for 275, here's what it looks like down payment wise, the monthly payment wise 300. Here's what it looks like 325. Because then when you're out there shopping or even before you're shopping, you can say, Oh, this neighborhood I'd pay this much. And here's what my monthly payment would look like hit this neighborhood. I can find something for 275. And my payment's going to be this helps you, develop a game plan. And and in a market like we're in, in most markets across the country in 2021, you don't necessarily have a bunch of time to think and make decisions. Like if you see a house you like, you might have to offer on it within the next 48 hours. So having all the information beforehand and knowing exactly mm-hmm. what you're looking for and, and price-wise and what that mortgage payment is going to look like, I think it relieves a lot of stress because then you just know, if I find something I like, I know I'm comfortable with the payment at 325. I know that we have the down payment funds and a little bit extra um, to, to make that happen. So 325, I'm comfortable with. Then you go in and you fall in love with the house. It's not an emotional decision. It's mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I've already thought about this in advance, and I and and we're we're ready and able to to pull the trigger at this price. Let's submit an offer. So you know, with that being said, what what is a person's timeline like from the beginning, from that time they apply and get you all the paperwork? To the time you get an answer back, how how long does that typically take? Well, for for us to get somebody an answer on if they're pre-approved, we aim to have that back to them in twenty four to forty eight hours, and so that will say you're pre-approved. And you know, there's some circumstances where you might be commission based, or you might have variable pay, or there might be something where we have to verify. You know, we've got to get a verification of employment from the um, employer that breaks down your pay. That can cause a little bit of delays, but nine times out of 10, we're, we're back with the person within 24 or 48 hours to have that pre-approval piece. And then, um, you know, depending and, you know, somebody might watch this a year from now and, and the market might have changed a little bit, but um, appraisers workload, lenders workload and all this stuff will advise the agent on how they want to write the offer. You know, are we mm-hmm. able to close loans in 22 days? Some markets it's yes, other markets it's not. I remember, um, 
you know, when we could get appraisals back in seven or eight days, it was no problem. And um, in 2021, we're, we're having a little bit of trouble getting appraisals in under 14 days. So um, some of the 14, 15 day closes might be more challenging in some markets, but um, you know, the, the closing process and actually getting offer accepted from, from start to finish, you know, that might be 21 to 30 days with most brokers. And then once you're pre-approved, how long is that uh, available to you? Like how long is a pre-approval good for? That's a really good question. Such a good question. I made a YouTube video on it, but I'll, <laughs> I'll answer it here too. Um, generally, a pre-approval means based on all the information we have, we can get you a loan up to this amount with this percent down if nothing changes. And so like I tell people, you know, if you don't change jobs, if you still have the money in the bank, if nothing's changed on your credit profile, it's still good. After 90 to 120 days, if you're still actively looking, we want to pull a fresh credit report. We want updated documents just because once that loan gets submitted, you know, you get an offer accepted, we actually have to submit it to a lender. They're going to want a credit report that's less than 120 days old. And they're going to want, um, you know, the most recent pay stub. So, so we're checking in with buyers every four to six weeks to kind of ask them these questions. Has anything changed? Are you still actively looking? Because as you can imagine, some people might go out, submit a few offers, they're gung ho, and then they'll take a break and they're not doing anything for two months. But when you're actively looking, um, you want to get in updated documents probably once a month or once every six weeks. And then you'll freshen up the pre-approval with the, with a new credit pool once every, let's call it four months. So with that being said, while you, they're pre-approved and they're out actively looking, are there any activities that they should avoid to make sure that they maintain that pre- pre-approval? Yes, they should definitely avoid anything that's going to change their credit profile. And this is a big one that as much as people try to shout from the rooftop, rooftops about not buying a new car or, or doing anything like that, um, that definitely affects your pre-approval because we pre approve you based on you've got this much in debt, you've got this much in income, you qualify for this amount. If you add $700 a month to that debt profile and you went out there and you bought a $55,000 car, you're not going to be approved for as much mortgage because you've got more debt on the debt side. And so really, if you're shopping for a home, you don't want to have any new credit lines. You know, Don't go out and get a new Best Buy card. Don't go out and... Um, you know, get, get your credit pulled, um, at the car dealership and certainly don't buy a car. Um, cause that, that, that stuff will affect it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so, um, save that stuff for after a lot of people, even during the loan process are like, but there was a deal on fridges. And if I financed them at home Depot or, or Best Buy, I was going to get 10% off. Just wait until you close on your home before you start opening up new credit cards or add, add new debt. Sure. So with, uh, with the rental property mortgages, is there any restrictions? Like, are you capped at a certain number of rental properties that you can use? Yeah. So most people, they want conventional financing because it's the, the best terms, the best rates and terms. And, you know, on a single family investment, you could probably get three and a half percent without paying any points. Um, Fannie and Freddie, who are the backers of those conventional loans, limit you at 10. And so, any individual is going to be capped to 10. I know some banks and some of the institutions that are a little bit more strict might even limit you at four. But for most of us in the mortgage space, we can do up to 10 per individual. What some people try to do is if it's a married couple, you can get a conventional loan in one name and you know you guys could both be on the title and both own the house, but only one on the mortgage. If you've got enough income to support it, husband can have 10, wife can also have 10. And so... Um, that's, that's something that a lot of investors I work with run into. As a residential mortgage broker, all I do is one to four unit residential stuff. And so once you get to those 10, you want to, you know, if you're, if you're looking at commercial loans, you're looking at some blanket loan where you can wrap those all into one, that's a commercial lender that you're going to have to speak to to do some of that stuff because, um, yeah, there's, there's people out there that, that are 50, 60, 70 properties and, and, and different mortgages. And, and that's going to be a, a different type of product, different commercial product. Yeah. And you, it, I'm glad you brought up the four units because up to four units, they can even qualify for a first time home buyer. 
Correct. Correct. Yeah. And, and for investors, I'm, I was just talking to a kid yesterday who's 18 and he's all gung ho about buying his first property. If I could go back and um, buy my first property, 18, 19, 20, 21, whenever you've got enough income to support it, you can buy a four unit with an FHA loan and put three and a half percent down. And the, the, you know, 30 year fix is going to be in the twos on that mortgage um, you, there, you're not going to ever find a way to get into a multi-unit for, for less than that. And mm-hmm. when you're, when you're single, you don't have a family, you don't mind living in a two bedroom, one bath. That's part of a, of a four unit, um, complex. And then you decide to move out and you go buy a single family, you go buy a duplex or whatever you end up doing. Now you've got four rental units. It's, 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 it's really a, a nice little kickstart to buy your first primary and three rentals. Um, all in one shot, all with three and a half percent down, and you move out to your next place, and you've got four rental units now. It's mm-hmm. a it's a cool product, and I think the video on my channel it's just FHA two to four units that talks about that because um, it's a great way as an investor to get started. Do you have to live in that unit for a certain amount of time for it to? Yeah, so FHA um, at least your intention is to live there for 12 months. And, and people ask me this all the time, you know, they're, they've been in it for 10 months and they want to, they, the, the multifamily living, living next to three of your tenants isn't, isn't what it's cracked up to be. And so they want to move out, you know, you're not going to have the FBI knocking on your door if you move out after 11 months. But when you sign the documents, um, the, the FHA loan is an owner occupied loan. You have to live there. And your intention is that you're going to move in and live there for, for 12 months. Um, if you, if plans change or something changes and you move out after nine and a half, um, you're, you're likely not going to jail, but at least, um, when you're signing papers and you're moving in, that's your intention is live there for a year. Sure. Well, I'm going to back up just a hair. We kind of went down one Avenue just because that's where the conversation led us. But, uh, you mentioned uploading a bunch of documents when they go through the pre-approval process, what type of documents would you typically need from people? Um, for a pre-approval, it's going to be 19 and 20 tax returns. I'm sorry. Let me, let me, let me back that up. If you're self-employed, we need tax returns. If you're not self-employed, all we need is W-2s. Um, but past two years. So for, for now we're collecting 19 and 20 and we'll just say W-2s. We'll pretend like you're a W-2 employee. Um, 30 days of your most recent pay stubs, two months of your most recent bank statements, and a copy of your ID. And, and really that's all we need is the full application and those items. When um, you're self-employed, we need your tax returns. If you own multiple properties, we'll need your full tax returns. There's always going to be certain circumstances where if you receive alimony, we're going to want you know copies of that paperwork. If you've got um, you know, other other types of of, of things going on with the, with the purchase, then there might be other documentation. But for the most part, a lot of people who, you know, you work for the state of California, it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. 30 days pay stubs, two, two years of Mm W-2s, two months of the bank statements, wherever the down payment's coming from and a copy of your ID. And it's just, it's that, that simple. Sure. Well, you know, I really appreciate this, Matt. This has been very insightful. And uh, I want to remind everybody again, to check out Matt's YouTube channel, Matt, the mortgage guy. And uh, before I let you go, my last question is, is there a question you wish I would have asked you here tonight? Huh? I don't know. I mean, I think that, that you, you dug into the, the spots that I'm passionate about, you know, helping people out and, and, and um, maybe if you ask me a question on what my mission is with the YouTube channel, it's just simplifying things. Because sure. there's so many people out there that are just talking with so many big words and making it so complicated when it's really not. I feel like, you know, from from 18-year-olds to 87-year-olds, I've, I've walked just about every type of, of person through this loan process, whether they understand how to work a computer or not, whether they're, um, you know, college educated or not. And um, everybody um, that has come across my desk or, or worked with me and my team, hopefully they found the process to be pretty straightforward and easy. And it's, it's, it's been a constant um, evolution of the business to try to make it that way because 
from the day I started the YouTube channel, um, I took advice from my wife that was pretend like you're talking to my grandma, you know, stop with all the fancy words and all the stuff you learned becoming a loan officer, just use simple terms. I mean, even, even as, as simple as just calling it a home loan. Sometimes I'll talk to people and they're like mortgage, what's mortgage, um, a home loan. I'm going to help you get a home loan. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's something I take a lot of pride in. Something I've, I've been working on is, is simplifying it for folks. Well, I really appreciate your time, Matt, and hope you can chat again sometime. Cool. Thanks, Jack. This has been the REI Mastermind Network. You can already tell that we've made some changes and a few more are on the way. If you are interested in what we have planned, head over to patreon.com slash REI Mastermind and support the show today. Financial contributions are always appreciated, along with a like, share, and review. It really helps us grow and reach more people with this valuable information. See you next time, and tell a friend.